I organized this conference in collaboration with the African Association for Logic, Philosophy of Science and Ethics of AI. Um, I'm calling on Dr. Arabia Otto to give us a three minutes opening remarks on behalf of Confucianal School of Philosophy. Arabia, please have the floor. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Amara, for organizing this uh, conference. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to just briefly uh, introduce the conversational school to those who may not be uh, very well conversant with it. So the Conversational School of Philosophy or the Conversational Society of Philosophy uh, is an offshoot of a larger school, uh, which is the Calabar School of Philosophy, uh, which is domiciled primarily at the University of Calabar. And so for the past three, four decades, the Calabar School has been producing seminal works in African philosophy and the conversational school emerges from that school as an offshoot of that school and continues to produce new contemporary ideas in, in African philosophy. Part of the aims of the conversational school of African philosophy uh, is to promote uh, the discourse in African philosophy, you know, curate the archives properly, the history of African philosophy, you know, um, and also produce new ideas in African philosophy. And so part of our aims like, is extending the frontiers of African philosophy. And so in areas like logic, uh, with amazing logic in areas of uh, metaphysics with ideas like uh, predeterministic historicity, ideas like consolationism, and so on and so forth, in philosophy or religion, and in many other aspects of African philosophy. Uh, the Conversational Society of Philosophy and its members have been working. Um, and we we do our work on the basis of the doctrine of uh, conversational philosophy and with the method of conversational thinking. Okay, so you're all welcome to participate in any events that we may have uh, in the coming years. Thank you very much for such a um, brief introduction and welcome. I'm calling on Shima Kunam Okeke to please give a three minute opening remarks on behalf of the African Association of Logic. The African Association for Logic, Philosophy of Science and the Ethics of AI is a new organization that um, some of us uh, have just set up um to enable african scholars philosophers logicians philosophy philosophers of science and ethicists especially those who focus on ethics of ai uh, to be able to participate in the ongoing debates uh in the new areas such as ai as well as the already old areas such as logic and philosophy of science most importantly from the african perspective so um, its membership is still growing. It is quite new. It was founded last year, 2023. Uh, but we already have a magazine and we are working towards releasing the first issue of that magazine. Uh, we have uh, held a, a mini conference last year and we organized a new, another one this year. And we are happy to collaborate with uh, Dr. A. E. H. Wakonam uh, in this very interesting project which aligns with what we are doing uh, to curate African contributions to logic, uh, philosophy of science and ethics of AI. So we are very much happy to be part of this project uh, that is taking place, um, uh, being put together by, by Dr. Chima Kanam at the um, University of Fort Hare. And uh, we appreciate those from University of Forte and other collaborators to this project. We hope that this will be uh, a sign of great things to come about different interest groups in academia in Africa collaborating to achieve some milestones. And um, we welcome all of you who are here and hope that we are going to have a very fruitful conversation and discussion uh, today. Thank you very much, and over to you, uh, the moderator. Thank you very much, Professor Chimaknam, for such a um, brief introduction and welcome. Um, This is the way our program will take off. The keynote speakers have for five minutes each, 30 minutes for their lectures, and 15 minutes for Q&A. The roundtable speakers have 25 minutes each, 15 minutes for 
their talk and 10 minutes for Q and A. Um, please let us stick to time so that we can finish on time and, and engage with the discussion more later. Detailed bio of the speakers can be found at slash worldlogicday.com slash events slash Africa. I'll paste the website link in the chat box. Professor Dorothy Orua Wimi Jacob is a full professor with five years of teaching experience and student development and classroom management, as well as experience in national and international conference presentation. She did her postdoctoral research at the Center for International Interdisciplinary sorry, Research on Ethics at Yale University, United States of America. She was a visiting professor at the Department of Philosophy, University of Pretoria, South Africa. She has, um, a moment please. She has published um, numerous articles and books. Um, please, Professor Dorothy Oluwabumi Jacob, please, you can have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amara. My paper is, I told African logic or logic in Africa, reflections on Chris Ijeoma's harmonious monism, formulation of harmonious monism as a peculiarly African logic. And the aim is to see whether such a position is relevant or irrelevant in addressing the challenges facing Africa at present. In, as part of the objective of this paper, I will highlight the distinction between informal, natural, and formal logic. I will also acknowledge that though logic, natural, of a people may be shaped by their realities. This does not preclude the fact that there are universal principles that guide reasoning and that such logical principles are not regionalized. I will also bring the interculturality perspective to bear on inferiorizing other cultures in formal logic. I urge the view that beyond claims regarding in the existence of African logic, as Ijeoma has done, concerted efforts should be made to show how logic can be employed to address Africa's socio-political challenges in the 21st century. Now, let me not waste our time reading the introduction of the paper, because that is where I try to uh, define what logic Logic is the different definitions of logic, the etymology of the word, and also the fact that from the etymology of the word, logic has a connection or link with language. Um, I have about three sections of this paper. One has to do with formal versus informal logic. I may not treat that one in detail. The second section has to do with logic, African logic or logic in Africa. In that section, I took time to look at the various perspectives regarding the possibility of African logic. And I had to review the works of several um, thinkers regarding that matter, including Uduma, Asuzo, Chima Konam, um, Bisong, Ebono, and several other authors that have written on the issue of African logic. And one thing they have in common is that African logic is the application of, you know, uh, reasoning to issues in Africa, that Africans also engage in reasoning and argumentation, and they will have to find a way to formalize such reasoning, just as Aristotle did with respect to Western logic. 
And one fact also I have to emphasize here is that before Aristotle, people were reasoning correctly. The only thing that Aristotle did was to formalize and systematize logic in the way we have it today by giving it a formalized structure. And independently of those formalized structure, people do reason, even though they may not understand the principles governing their reasoning or giving names to maybe fallacies or errors in reasoning when they commit such. Now, where my main focus is, is actually on idiomas, harmonious monism, which is the aspect of African logic that has to do with him. And I will crave your indulgence to permit me to read this aspect of my work with respect to the reflection and also look at the reflections emanating from this from his work. Chris Ijoma's formulation of African logic. In his perspective on African logic, Ijoma formulates an alternative logic that could explain supernaturalism supernaturalistic experiences. This is what he calls the logic of harmonious monism. This is a kind of three-valued logic. Essential to this logic is the view that logic is the science of relation or explanation that deals with statements or assertions, as well as a product of a particular way people perceive reality. Clearly, Ijeoma's perspective on African logic accepts the coexistence of seemingly opposing realities that are contraries, which complement into this logic lies itself without what it is not. This simply means that everything actualizes itself only when it absorbs what it is Hello. not. He highlights in his system the idea of African science of relation that asserts that everything in the world, including X, has a missing link. For X, this missing link is something other than X. It is not X. According to him, X yearns and struggles to capture the missing link. The German's idea of harmonious monism makes sense in the context of African ontological realities that rest on the relationship between the physical and the spiritual. For him, the logics of the West and harmonious monism differ because the logics of the West do not allow extremes. For example, materialism and spiritual, spiritualism to meet. In harmonious monism, extremes meet and none superimposes itself on the other or feel inferior or superior to the other. The relationship is one of reciprocity. He therefore contrasts the logic of the West that rests on contradiction of opposites from that of Africa that rests on the principle of missing links and integration. Concretely, the German agrees with Etuk that communitarian principles affect one. If anyone costs another person's palm fruit, he will pay fine. Second premise, S has caught another person's palm fruit. If it is in the Western world view, with the two premises above, it does follow that S, community, S will not be fine. The question is, is it really the way the communitarian logic functions and rendered unworkable principle of modus ponens, like the one used by Etu? and cited by Ijeoma breaks down in the face of communitarian values. So I'm trying to give the example of uh, the issue of uh, palm trees, harvesting palm fruits in Obakala community of Umuahia in Abia State, Nigeria. Now that community, normally men and women who are interested in harvesting the palm fruits go to contract palm tree climbers from other places to come and call for them at a fee. Harvesting the palm fruits 
outside the approved time by the elders, even if such are in one's farmland is frowned at and can attract sanctions from the community. On the farmland outside the approved time, then he will face sanctions. X has harvested palm fruit outside the approved time, therefore, just. This kind of deductive reasoning guides the activities of the villagers. As a matter of fact, an individual dares not harvest palm fruits from the farmland because such will be sanctioned. As the locals will not make this rule and watch it violated, they are the ones that enforce the punishment or sanctions that are attached to this. They refuse to live in contradiction. The issue of bride price and marriage is a community affair. In fact, the parents of the bride have no say as to what the suitor is going to to bring. At the end of the day, when the community collects, they will give the parents their own share. But one thing about that community is that the bride price or the normal customary things done, the mother of that child will be excluded from the sharing of marriage gifts from, gifts from other women. And the hypothetical syllogism, uh, modus ponens, the modus ponens are can be put this way. If a girl runs off with a man without being properly married, then the mother will not participate in marriage gifts. X has run off with a man without being properly married. Therefore, X will not, therefore, the mother will not participate in marriage gifts. One is also reminded of what happened in Chinua Chepes, things fall apart where Okonkwo accidentally killed someone, exploding the native exploding the native gun. The law in the village was that anyone who killed someone would be banished for seven years. Okonkwo was banished for seven years, regardless of the fact that what happened was accidental. His social status was irrelevant to the matter. Now, it is the violations of the rules of logic, because Ujama is giving the impression that for communitarian reasons, premise two can be violated by exemption. If you look at that particular view and what is happening in Nigeria today, you will understand that that particular view is dangerous. We have a scenario now in Nigeria where constitutional rules are violated because of some considerations. Take, for example, the constitution says that if any member of parliament defects to another party, he loses his parliamentary seat. Rather, one sees a scenario where one defects to another party, and yet people are advocating that such should still occupy his or her seat in the parliament because the party defects affected to is the ruling party. What about a scenario where a corrupt politician who should be in jail is told that if he defects from his party and joins the ruling party, his sins will be forgiven against all the rules to the contrary. The reason for such violations of standard rules of logic may be religion, ethnic, or political affiliation. The point I am making is that Africans reason in conformity with the formal principles of logic. It's actually not keeping with such principles that is the problem. I want to reflect on Ijeoma's uh, uh, position, some of the issues raised in his harmonious monism. I'm taking three pronged approaches in my reflections. Number one has to do with his repudiation of the three traditional laws of thought. Number two is the question of universalizability of his formulation. And number three, let's look at the repudiation of the traditional laws of thought. Now the process of judging involves conjoining and disjoining notions. In its conjoining mode, judgment is affirmative while it is negative in its disjoining mode. 
for instance, the judgment, some realities are spiritual, is an affirmative judgment. While some realities are not spiritual, it's negative. Here, two laws emerge. One conditions the affirmative judgment, while the other conditions the negative judgment. The law, which permits the affirmative judgment, is the law of identity, while the law that allows a negative judgment is the law of contradiction. The law of the excluded middle combines the other two in either or mode. In his formulation of harmonious monism, Ijoma proposes the three-valued logic as an alternative to the Western Aristotelian logic that is two-valued and rests on the three traditional laws of thought. He argues that these laws are non-viable in the African context due to the complementarity of the physical and spiritual realities. The question is, granted that certain realities in the African setting cannot be explained using the three laws of thought, does that re render these laws nugatory? Must the formulation of three-valued logic necessarily lead to the repudiation of the three traditional laws of thought? Is three-valued logic peculiarly African Three-valued logic is not the child of Joma's construction. As far back as the 1920s, the Polish logician, Lucas Sierwis, had articulated a three-value other than true or false, in which the three traditional laws of thought were found to be inadequate. However, throwing these laws overboard, it is not correct to say that Africans do not reason in conformity with the Western logic, specifically the three laws. For the African, what is evil is evil, and something cannot be evil and good at the same time. It is either something is evil or not evil. It would have been safer for Ijeoma to hammer on the limitedness or inadequacy of these laws in explaining the connection between physical and spiritual realities, instead of repudiating them as non-viable in the context of Africa. For the avoidance of doubt, the two-valued logic has a place in the African scheme of things and have instances where they apply. Thus, consistent with the logic of complementarity, such can be said to complement the three-valued logic Ijeoma's position is not in keeping with interculturality that requires respect and tolerance for other cultural perspectives for the purpose of mutual enrichment. I want to look at the question of universalizability. Now, when it comes to logical thinking in any questions I raised, this include one, does all this, does all of this, fit together logically? Two, does this really make sense? Three, does that follow from what you said? Four, how does that follow from the evidence? Five, before you implied this, now you are saying that. I don't see how both can be true. This implies that thinking logically requires bringing a variety of thoughts together in some order. Such combined thoughts can be mutually supported. And in that case, makes sense or fail to, mutual, to be mutually supporting. And in that case, does not make sense. Anywhere people have to deliberate on issues that concern them, be they social or political, is taken for granted that questions in the similitude of the, of the above will be thrown up. This is bound to happen irrespective of whether the society is. This is what it means for logical thinking to be universalizable. Bringing this to bear on one's discourse here, Ijeoma's harmonious monism cannot pass this test. His system of logic is culture bound and would make sense only to a particular cultural group. This is not the goal of African logic or logic in Africa. The question of relevance. The idea of missing links and complementarity 
Permeus idiomas formulation. I find this quite relevant to the Africa of today that has been beleaguered by ethnic and political conflicts. The principles of complementary logic that promote open-mindedness. A missing link rather than an opponent we go a long way to address the challenge of ethnic conflicts and wars in Africa, if properly propagated through education and political campaigns. Complementarity results in the unity of contraries harmonizing each other. However, Ijeoma's idea of the spiritual and the spiritual dovetailing into physical, as adumbrated in his harmonious monism, we not set in the globalized world of 21st century. In this regard, African logicians should seek ways to use their discipline as an instrument for African logic, that speak to the multifarious problems assailing the African continent is a major These are my reflections on Ijeoma's um, formulation of harmonious uh, monism. Uh, by way of conclusion, one, I want to affirm that and that African logic should not be emanating from Africa, should be constructed in such a way that such can have a universal application. There is nothing wrong in combining two valid logic and three valid logic in the same course of proof. Basically, these are some of my reflections. Thanks for listening. Um, thank you so much. I believe that we must have learned a lot from her lecture. Questions, comments, and answers. Aristotelian law says, like if you look at the uh, three traditional laws of thought, the law of identity, contradiction and the law of uh, excluded and middle. This law, if A, you cannot assert non-A at the same time. But the John must say, look, there is a third value where A and not A can coexist without contradiction. That's why he was talking about the issue of the physical dovetailing into the spiritual and the spiritual dovetailing into the uh, physical. In other words, for the traditional African, a, an object has some spirituality element in it. Look at the, the, the two positions. It's like if you take them separately, they are contradictory. There are two extremes that cannot meet from the Western point of view, first Western logic point of view. But for harmonious monism, according to Ijeoma, that these two can harmoniously coexist. One is the missing link of the other. That is the difference between the two. So Aristotle's logic does not go beyond that second value, either true or false. If this one is true, then this cannot be false. So something cannot be both true and false at the same time. Uh, Nelton, you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for your uh, your talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions here. The first one is that I wish to ask, is there a, maybe you could help to share some light. There has been an argument within the the within the African uh, logicians that what we call African logic is different from logic in Africa. Somebody like uh, Hudson G had made that ag argument that there is nothing like African logic that what he calls 
logic in Africa. So can you please help to share some light? What is there an African logic synonymous with logic in Africa? Or is it the case that both are the same or perhaps different? That is the first question. The second question, within the context of an inclusive disjunction, I wish to ask uh, Aristotle's two valid logic, which rather argues that uh, a thing cannot be both true and false at the same time. It is either it is true or it is false, just by the two polar uh, positions of uh, a particular statement or a, an argument, wherein it's either it is true or it is false. How do we factor that within the context of an inclusive disjunction? How do we, is there a similarity between uh, Aristotle to valid logic with the inclusive sense of a disjunction, wherein uh, an, a statement can, where, wherein it is argued that a statement is not just true, but we have a situation where a particular statement can both be true, but not necessarily false at the same time. So that's my, those are my questions. I don't know if I'm clear. Yeah, let me begin with uh, the issue of African logic. Now, when we are talking about African logic, the basic question is not whether Africans reason logically. It's assumed that the capacity to reason is innate and it's a property of every normal human being. Now, when we are talking about African, um, African logic, deliberate and to engage in argumentative procedure. But then we are now relating or applying these, our reasoning processes to issues to reality what I was trying to do. But when you talk about logic in Africa, uh, there is an issue. It has to do with probably somebody waking up one morning that is only peculiar because are contending with it. That logic is universalable and because it is universalable, we cannot afford to geographically categorize it to the point of maybe you have Zulu logic, you have Igbo logic, or you have Hausa logic. And that's the position of uh, innocent Asozo, that logic is a universal activity. The rules and principles are there, whether people are conscious of them or not. You don't need to go to school to study propositional calculus or predicate calculus in order for you to reason correctly. So when we're talking about logic in Africa, the aim there is not to come and start regionalizing or categorizing logic geographically in order for us to say, okay, Africans are doing well. So African logic is such that even with the way we are reasoning the way we are applying logic in our realities. You can, from that observation, come up with a formalized system of logic. How did Aristotle come up with his uh, formal system? It didn't just fall from the blues. It was based on observations. The things that he observed, and he began to, you know, codify them. He began to systematize them, and that's how we have our formal system of logic today. African writers can also do the same from the realities that we have on ground. So that is the issue. Now, when you go to the issue of inclusive uh, disjunction, now, if you look at the disjunction as a logical operator, we have the inclusive sense, as you rightly pointed out. We also have the The rule is either or perhaps both. In other words, if you say X, either X is going to the hospital or X 
is writing his examination. And then you say, X. X is writing his examination. Inclusive disjunction is saying that either or. But if it is exclusive disjunction, there is no possibility that somebody will be going to the hospital and at the same time writing his examination. So if you look at those two senses of disjunction, it does not involve any contradiction. It's still in keeping with a lot of excluded uh, middle. That either or, it is either A or, or it A is either B or not B. There is no middle course. That is the point Aristotle is trying to make. And I don't think it involves any contradiction from the point of view of the three laws of thought. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I think your, your criticism of uh, Ijoma's harmonious monism got me thinking. And I have this two in one question to ask. Do you accept that Ijoma's harmonious monism is a trivalent logic? If yes. Now, Ijoma himself affirm that his logic is trivalent. This logic, the way Chimakonam has done on his own. And uh, if you look at that uh, position, it was uh, there was some kind of mathematical formula he was coming to go into that mathematical formula in order to show that when you have X and you have uh, not X, that the two can come into union. So then when you have a Venn diagram, Venn diagram A, Venn diagram B, you have a point of intersection that, uh, that is a union of the two Venn diagrams. He's tried to do that in his work. But when it comes to the giving us proper details about the, the trivalent nature of harmonious monism, area where he tends to be doing something is on this issue of being physical and being spiritual and the two of them clarity that borders on travelers completely with him or not is personal to me which i may not want to go into at this point that's his position okay thank you very much um for such an interesting lecture and thank you for the responses. Um, uh, we are truly sorry at this time we can't entertain more questions and comments. Thank you once again, Prof, for your thought-provoking lecture.